In the year 325 of the Common Era, a world-changing event took place, which was the first Council of Nicaea. Nicaea is a city located in Turkey. 318 bishops from all over the Roman Empire assembled to discuss the world of Christianity. From this meeting, the core system of beliefs was developed. The council was convened by Roman Emperor Constantine I who later made Christianity the official state religion of Rome. Constantine was over 40 years old when he had his alleged conversion to Christianity following his victory at the Battle of the Milvon Bridge. Under his rule, Christianity became the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. One Empire! One God! In the year 313 of the Common Era, Constantine passed the Edict of Milan. This law declared that all religions are to be tolerated and that none should be persecuted for the worship of their god. The Milan Edict did not make paganism illegal, nor at the time did it make Christianity the official religion of Rome. According to this, each man will be free to worship the god he chooses. Why? Have you become a Christian? I believe in whichever God looks kindly upon our enterprise. So do I have your word that the Christian God will not be favored above our gods? This isn't about God or gods. This is about us. This cements our alliance and says to the world that we speak with one voice, a new voice. Hmm? The voice of a stronger and more united empire. After his conversion, Emperor Constantine did not follow Christianity exclusively. He retained the title Pontifus Maximus until his death, a title that emperors wore as heads of the pagan priesthood. He continued to engage in pagan rituals and the honoring of pagan Roman gods. Here is a Constantine coin. In its inscription honors pagan sun god Apollo yet he continued to produce them even after his so-called conversion. Another example of Constantine honoring pagan gods can be seen in the Arch of Constantine, which was constructed to celebrate his victory at the Battle of the Milvon Bridge. Images of the goddess Victoria along with Zeus and Hercules can be seen carved on the arch. Through the Council of 325, doctrines were formed. This council agreed to refer to Jesus Christ as a God, but the scriptures refer to him as the Son of the Most High, Yahweh. The Nicene Creed goes on to say that the Father and Son are of the same substance and are co-eternal gods. But this is not in scripture, for in John 14:28, Yeshua says, The Father is greater than me. Yeshua, speaking about his second coming in Matthew 24, 36, says, No one knows the day or the hour, the angels in heaven don't know, and the Son himself doesn't know, only the Father knows. If the Son is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father, how come the Father knows something that the Son doesn't know? The second version of the Nicene Creed in 381 CE speaks of the union of the Holy Spirit along with the Father and the Son. The Council completely changed the truth that was taught 300 years prior by the true followers of the Messiah. In order for the Emperor Constantine to gain acceptance of Christianity, he had to appease the pagan worshippers of his day. He accomplished this by incorporating many of their beliefs, such as the Trinity or Triunity of Gods. 
The late Alexander Hislop in his book, The Two Babylons, wrote, The cult that arose in Babylon and spread its cult tentacles throughout the world was Trinitarian. Another belief in Christianity is going to heaven or hell after death. The scriptures teach that our future home is not in heaven, for Yeshua stated that the meek will inherit the earth. Yeshua also said in John 3.13, And no one has gone up to heaven, except he having come down out of heaven. The book of Ecclesiastes states, We know that we will die, but the dead don't know a thing. Our hope is in the resurrection of the dead, at the Messiah's second coming and kingdom. In the year 321, Sunday was declared the official day of rest, on which markets were banned from opening and public offices were closed. Sunday observance is one of the marks of Constantine's Christianity. In 312, as he was preparing the battle, he had a vision of a cross in the sky, and he was told in this vision, in this sign conquer. From this vision, in the workings of the Nicene Council, the ancient pagan symbol called the cross became the banner of the Christian faith. In the ancient world, the cross was used as a symbol to represent the union between male and female. The cross was used as a religious phallic symbol as far back as ancient Babylon. During the time of the apostles, they taught against what would become modern doctrines of the Christian religion. Have you ever wondered why the following statements have never appeared in scriptures? Christians are my people. I love the Christians. Or salvation is from Christianity. A very in interesting fact to consider. The word Christian can only be found three times in Scripture. Acts 11.26, Acts 26.28, and 1 Peter 4.16. The word Christian comes from the Greek word Christianos. Christianos means the smeared ones, or to smear on. The Most High never named his people by this title. It was given to them from others. The word Christian began as a derogatory term and gained acceptance over time. The outsiders referred to him as Christianos, but they referred to themselves as brothers, sisters, saints, believers, and Israelites. These were the ones executed, burned at the stake, and eaten by lions for keeping the true word. Persecution of believers was from both pagan Rome and papal Rome. By the close of the first Council of Nicaea, a truly different world had emerged. No longer did believers wait for the Day of Judgment. Judgment was completed immediately after death. The doctrine of the Trinity was formed, and the Most High was divided into three gods. No longer was the seventh day of the week the Sabbath, it was changed to the first day. By all measures, Christianity was indeed a new religion, one that wasn't found on the laws and commandments of Scripture or the teachings of the prophets and the Messiah. It was created from ancient pagan concepts and mysteries. Everything about this religion is against the truth. 
Many proclaim the Most High has many names. Some say knowing his correct name doesn't matter, while others profess his true name is equal to salvation itself. In ancient and modern Israelite culture, names were given based on the character of a person. For example, Abram's name was changed to Abraham, which means the father of a multitude, as Abraham became the father of many nations. Neither shall your name any more be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made you. The scriptures teaches the name of the Most High and His Son, Yahweh and Yeshua, and highly admonishes us to call them by their proper names. In fact, it is the third commandment. We must honor and cherish His name. It is the foundation of our salvation. The scriptures plainly teach that we are to use His name in prayer and in worship and in praise. Although you see the name listed as Jah in the King James Version of the Bible, the name is actually Yah. There is no letter J, J equivalent, or J sound in the Hebrew language. In fact, the letter J is one of the newest letters in the English alphabet. It came into widespread usage sometime after the year 1630. The prophet Jeremiah states, They have forgotten my name for Baal. And the prophet Hosea said that you will no more call me my Baal, for I will take away the names of Baal out of her mouth. Now from the prophet Isaiah, they said they have arrayed a table for God, the Babylonian deity of fortune. Baal Gad is the pagan deity of fortune, or money. The name Jehovah has no meaning. The name of this deity would be foreign to the prophets, the Messiah, and the apostles. It would be foreign to English-speaking people 500 years ago. Jehovah has no part in Yah's salvation. As was mentioned earlier, there is no letter J in the Hebrew language. The reason this point is important is that Hebrew and Aramaic was the language in which the original scriptures were written. From there it was translated into other languages such as Greek. Being there is no letter J, there could not have been a person in existence among the Israelites 2,000 years ago named Jesus. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12 He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of Yahweh. But as many as received him, to them he gave he power to become the sons of Yahweh, even to them that believe on his name. The name Jesus, just like Jehovah, has no meaning. Before the letter J was added to the English alphabet, Jesus was pronounced Iusus. The name is derived from the Greek goddess Iosis. This fact can explain why many images of Jesus are portrayed to be feminine in appearance. Iusus is the name rendered in the original 1611 King James Bible. Jesus is also related to the Greek god Zeus. In Spanish, his name is pronounced Jesus. Jesus Christ was a combination of Zeus and the Hindu deity Krishna. Every nation across the world has a system of laws or rules in place. A nation without rules and laws would be a nation of total chaos. The Most High placed rules and laws to maintain order among his creation, mankind. The first five books of scripture is known as the Torah. 
Torah means instruction or laws. Yahweh's Torah is his instruction on how we are to live on the earth as a human family. In our society, anyone who breaks the law of the land are called criminals. In Yahweh's word, a lawbreaker is called a sinner. Sin is directly related to the laws of Yahweh, for sin is the transgression or breaking of the Torah. Everyone practicing sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is breaking of the Torah. Everything in creation is based on laws. The sun has a law it has to obey, so does the stars, earth, moon, etc. Just think, if the earth broke the laws of rotating around the sun in any 12 month period, there would be total chaos in our planetary system. The earth follows its instructions given to it by Yahweh. Mankind and Satan are the ones who question the commandments of the Father. Animals, plants, trees, and water are all under his authority. There is a doctrine that exists within Christianity that states Jesus Christ nailed the laws of Yahweh to the cross, and we are no longer required to keep his commandments anymore. All a Christian has to do is believe in Jesus, and all will be fine. According to the scripture, this doctrine is straight from the mouth of Satan. Our Messiah never said we are no longer required to keep Yahweh's law, neither did any of his apostles, and this includes the Apostle Shaul. If there was no law, then there could be no sin, and if there was no sin, then there couldn't be any judgment. He didn't come to destroy the law or any of the prophets. He didn't come to do away with any of them. He came to fulfill or give us a deeper understanding of what the Torah says. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jot or tittle means the smallest letter or particle of a letter or the stroke of the pen. A quick look at one of the commandments that many take to be so small that is not even considered or even mentioned in the Christian churches. In the book of Numbers chapter 15 verse 38 we read about this very important commandment of wearing our tassels or fringes. We are commanded to wear tassels with a cord of blue sewn in on the four corners of our garment. The purpose of wearing our tassels is so that we always remember the commandments of Yahweh. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind and touched the tassel of his garment. Jesus Christ of Christianity teaches his followers not to obey the Torah. Christians are led to believe they are free from the law for the following reasons. Jesus did away with the laws. The laws are for the Jews and are not for the Christians. And the laws are too hard to keep. All these points according to scripture are outright lies. Yahweh's laws were here from the beginning. His laws did not begin with Moses and the children of Israel. They are with the human family from the beginning of our creation. As it stands, Moses was the first and only man to deliver the laws of Yahweh to an entire nation of people. Prior to the birth of the Israelite nation, the Torah was here with Noah. When Noah was given the instructions of bringing the animals upon the ark, Yahweh told him to bring them according to the laws of clean and unclean animals. Of every clean beast you shall take to you by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean, by two, the male and his female. 
A clean animal is one that is good for food. An unclean animal is one Yahweh has not set apart for food. Yahweh told Noah to bring seven pairs of clean animals upon the ark and two pairs of unclean animals. The clean animals could be eaten upon the ark and this was food for Noah and his family. Noah knew of this law before Moses pronounced it in the 11th chapter of the book of Leviticus. I'll go into more about that later on. And he spared not the old world to save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood upon the world of the wicked. What is righteousness? My tongue shall answer your words, for all your commandments are righteousness. The book of Psalms just told us that Yahweh's commandments are righteousness. The book of Psalms also tells us something else about Yahweh's laws. Your righteousness is forever, and your Torah is truth. You are near, O Yahweh, and all your commandments are truth. If you have no law, you have no righteousness, truth, or even sin. In the book of John, chapter 8, verse 32, it says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If we substitute the definition of truth into this verse, this is what we get and you shall know the laws and the commandments so set you free. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Satan has deceived all of Christendom to believe they don't need the laws of Yahweh. He has deceived you into believing that you are something called a New Testament Christian and the Old Testament is no longer a benefit to you. This is a lie, and the reason he tells you this is to keep you in sin and to keep you away from righteousness and truth. During the time of the Messiah, there was no book in existence called the New Testament. When he taught, he came directly from the Laws and the Prophets, which titled the Old Testament today. He didn't teach one thing from the book of Romans, Galatians, etc. Think on this for a moment. If you only read from half the book, the New Testament, you're only getting part of the story. The next time you watch a movie or read a book, start reading or watching from the middle or the end and see how much understanding you receive. Take a look at another commandment the Christian world finds fit not to keep. This of course is the Shabbat or Sabbath day. The Sabbath day was instituted during the days of creation. It is impossible to change this day. It is commemorating Yah's six days of creation and resting on the seventh. Keep the Sabbath day set apart is a commandment. And Yahweh blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which Yahweh created and made. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh your Elohim. In it you shall not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger that is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Christendom's day is Sun's day, or Sunday. Sunday was the day set apart by the ancient Roman Empire for the god Mithra. It was the day his followers gathered to assemble to worship the sun god. Roman Emperor Constantine legislated Sunday as a day as of March 3rd in the year 321 of the Common Era. Constantine decreed that Sunday or Dies Solus will be observed as the day of rest. The Christian establishment has hidden the true meaning of sun or Sunday worship from its followers. 
It has been a long tradition for Christians to enter church on the first day of the week, Sun's Day, for early sunrise service in honor of the sun god. They had been led to believe that they were not worshiping the S-U-N God, but the S-O-N Son of God. There is not one scripture that changed the seventh day Sabbath to the first day. Christians assume the Messiah was executed on a Friday which was celebrated and renamed Good Friday and rose early Sunday morning. From this understanding the Christians say the Sabbath was changed for Saturday the seventh day of the week for Sunday the first day of the week. That is impossible. Friday to Sunday does not constitute three days and three nights. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the wheel's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The day of the Messiah's resurrection they call Easter Sunday, named after the fertility goddess of Babylon. More about this topic later in this presentation. The Christian religion is based on sun worship. The evidence can be found in the doctrine, practice, and symbolism, also an artwork. The sun plays a very important role in Christendom. The halo seen in many Christian paintings and icons shown in the form of usually a circular glow around the head of a person is not scriptural. The word halo comes from the Greek word halos, which means the ring around light around the sun. Holy men of the pagan world were said to shine from the light of the sun god. Therefore, they are always shown with images of the sun or halo around their heads in art. It was represented in, of many ancient religions and nations, Egypt, Babylon, Hellenistic Greece, Rome, Hindu, and Buddhism, and was picked up by the Christians. The biggest sun-worshipping symbol is the cross or crucifix. The Egyptians used the exact same cross as the Christians used. This can be seen in many of their hieroglyphics. The Egyptians also use another form of the cross called an Ankh. We are instructed by Yahweh in the book of Exodus not to have any graven images in our midst. He strongly commands us not to partake in idolatry as it states in Exodus chapter 20 verses 4 through 5. The Greek word staros means a stake or post set upright. You shall not make to you any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. For I, Yahweh, your Elohim, am jealous visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. The images of Jesus, crucifixes, which number in the billion around the world, is the image of idolatry. It is the exact thing that Yahweh told us not to do. There are not any historical images created of the Messiah. Much of the Christian artwork that depicts Jesus in certain stance or a pose is taken directly from ancient Egyptian gods. The likeness of Zeus may still survive today. Many art historians believe that the facial features of the statue were used as a model for images of Jesus. Painting 
why do you keep using this Jesus? Uh, well, this is patterned after an image that was created by Warner Selman in uh, 1940, I believe it was. And uh, he was asked to create this image so that they could make small uh, wallet-sized reproductions of it to hand out to the servicemen. And uh, that image was so widely distributed, and uh, still is today, that uh, this has come to uh, be the uh, traditional representation that when people look at it, they think, well, this is what Christ looks like. This is that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And when you look that up in the original Greek, it's a word, Greek word that means to disguise. So it says Satan is disguised as an angel of light, and his ministers are disguised as ministers of justice. And the scripture warns about this deception that's going to come through the Christian religion. This represents the son of perdition because it's really an uh, antichrist or imitation. As from the Greek, uh, the word anti can mean instead of or in place of. So when people think of this antichrist, that it's going to be this evil demon, so he, he has to do it by deceiving and coming on as this good guy. And that's where this disguising, Satan disguising as an angel of light, that's how that comes in. This is instead of Christ, in place of Christ. And not only the image, but even down to the name, where it's only in modern English that we have the name Jesus. A couple of hundred years ago, that name never existed. And so that people, by accepting this false imagery, They've already accepted the Antichrist. Yahweh's instructions also cover what we eat. The food we can consume and the food we can't. Not all the animals were meant to be eaten. Some were created to be food and some for other purposes. In the United States, many would consider it to be an abomination to eat rat, cat, dog, or horse. And rightfully so. Those animals are unclean and were never meant to be food. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 11, Yah tells us we must not eat rabbits, rat, dogs, cats, monkeys, apes, alligators, pork, shrimp, catfish, lobster, crab, vultures, owls, etc. 
Just by looking at these animals, it becomes apparent that we are not supposed to eat them. Animals that are created for human consumption are sheep, goats, deer, cow, any fish with fins and scales, such as perch, whiting, trout, and salmon. We can eat chicken, turkey, quail, and so on. These are some of the animals Noah brought upon the ark by sevens. The instructions and laws of Yahweh bring us discipline and make us civilized. Only an in uncivilized people would eat anything or everything set before their face. From Genesis to Revelation, there doesn't exist one law that says we can eat animals Yahweh has deemed unclean. What is the proof that we love Yahweh and His Son? By this we know that we love the children of Yahweh when we love Yahweh and keep His commandments. For this is the love of Yahweh, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not a burden to us. Christianity is a lawless religion. They have no truth, righteousness, wisdom, understanding from Father Yahweh. For sin shall not master it over you, for you are not under the penalty of law-breaking, but under grace. Does grace equal no law? Not at all. Shaul is speaking about us not being under immediate punishment for breaking the law and not having to bring sacrificial animals to the altar to pray for our sins. Yahweh has given us a grace period to correct our lawless ways. It is a must that we have the true Messiah over us as Master. He is the representation of the Torah and how to walk in it. Grace is Yahweh's mercy or favor upon us. Our grace period has begun. Only Yahweh knows how long our grace period will last. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the penalty of the Torah, but under grace? Let it not be. Do we then nullify the Torah by faith? Far be it. On the contrary, we establish the Torah. For the law of the Spirit of life, which is in Yahshua the Messiah, set me free from the law of sin and death. Now you know you have a grace period and won't receive immediate punishment and required to bring animal sacrifices to the altar. Does this mean you continue to transgress Yahweh's Torah and sin? No, Yahweh forbid. The Apostle Shaul goes on to tell us that the wages of sin is death. Sin, the transgression of the Torah, is death. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of Yahweh is everlasting life in Yeshua, Messiah, our Master. The scriptures say that the wages of sin is death, not everlasting torment in a place called hell. Christendom adopted many pagan beliefs and doctrines from paganism such as purgatory, eternal hellfire, and so on. Everlasting life, what do the scriptures say? Will it be in heaven, or hell, or on earth? We've already seen from Matthew 5 that Yeshua said that the meek would inherit the earth, not any place called heaven. So what about this doctrine of hell? The word hell, as used in our English Bibles, has two different meanings. One means the grave, or the abode of the dead, and the other means a garbage dump that was outside the walls of Jerusalem. The doctrine of the immortal soul started in paganism. The scriptures teach that man is a soul, not has one. And Yahweh Elohim formed the man out of the dust of the ground, and blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul.
And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Gehenna was a garbage dump that was just south of the old city of Jerusalem. And it was used for bodies of criminals, carcasses of animals, and it was burnt and kept going all the time. The fire was never put out. Because thou won't leave my soul in the grave, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. This verse was referring to the resurrection of Yeshua, and it says that he was in the grave for three days and three nights, not any fiery, tormenting place called hell. The word hell comes from the Anglo-Saxon word helen, which means to cover. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good to the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in Yahweh, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. as in Adam all die, so also in Messiah all will be made alive, but each in his own order, Messiah the firstfruit, afterwards those of the Messiahs at his coming. All the dead in Messiah will rise first, then we remain alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet with our master in the air. And so we'll always be with our Master. Another change brought in from the Roman Catholic and some Protestant churches is the mode of baptism, which is baptism, immersion or sprinkling. Baptism literally means immersion. To baptize is to immerse or plunge or dip into. Infants are not able to make a choice regarding salvation or repentance, etc. Acts 2.38, Then Peter said to them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, or the Ruach HaKodesh. first followers of the Savior never went to church. They were called Nazarenes, or followers of the way. In the Apostle Paul's trial before Felix, the lawyer for the prosecution said, We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. The word church is derived from an old English term, kirk, which means circle. Long ago, the Anglo-Saxons referred to their places of worship as kirks. When they accepted Christianity, they simply called their worship centers kirks, which later evolved into churches. The word kirk is also the root of the English term circus. The kirk church is where the term three-ring circus originated. Church or kirk comes from the Greek goddess Cirque, who specialized in turning men into pigs. Pagan goddess Circe, the daughter of Helios. 
Later, the masses followed as emperors and monarchs accepted the creed. It was Roman Emperor Constantine the Great who mandated Christianity to be the universal religion. However, before he did this, Constantine made huge changes in the faith. The pagan emperor Constantine sought to establish a religion that was totally free from all Jewish influence. He stated, let us have nothing in common with the Jewish crowd. These decrees mandated that ancient pagan practices like Christmas, Easter, and Sunday worship should be considered as Christian. The original building program was developed by Emperor Constantine as well. The first church buildings were placed over the tombs of popular martyrs. Road seating was provided for passive crowds to watch. The professional clergy performed the acts of worship while the laity looked on as spectators. And the steeple was born when pagans who converted to Christianity insisted the pagan obelisk be used at all church buildings. The obelisk, a symbol of Nimrod or Baal, is God. It is an ancient uh, phallic symbol representing the male member. Here is the Vatican phallic symbol in Vatican Square, the obelisk, St. Peter's Square, Rome. Uh, the Washington Memorial at left in Washington, D.C. in the pagan Egyptian obelisk. Mecca also has a obelisk. Here's the Washington Monument phallic symbol. And I will destroy your high places and cut down your images and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul shall hate you. A pure faith does exist in the hearts and homes of those willing to forsake man-made traditions and seek truth. But in vain do they worship a teaching for doctrines the commandments of men and has gone and served other gods and worshipped them, or the sun, or the moon, or any of the host of heaven which I have forbidden. All practices related to sun worship. First day of the week, dedicated to the sun god, or sun's day, with the fertility rites of Easter and the birth of the sun god in December, was incorporated into this new religion. This new religion was Christianity, but the name of Yahweh's people is Israel. Israel received the oracles of Yahweh at Mount Sinai. This was the covenant of the marriage. These laws of the covenant include the dietary law, the Sabbath day, and Yah's set apart feast days. The laws included the obligations of Israel being obedient to the laws of Yahweh and spoke of Yahweh's provisions and responsibilities for Israel. The covenant was ratified with blood pointing to a one man, one woman marriage. This covenant was never renewed. The covenant was a legal contract of promises and obligations from both Israel and Yahweh. But Israel was unfaithful. They neglected the Torah. Israel shall surely be led captive out of their own land. Hear the word of Yahweh, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away, and say, He who gathers Israel will gather him and keep him, as the shepherd keeps his flock. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. 
Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, and after those days, says Yahweh, I will put their law on their inward parts, and write it on their hearts, and will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. Yahweh, in his mercy, promises to renew the former contract, a much better one. He is going to write the laws of Yahweh into the hearts of Israel. The new covenant is only for Israel. Israel is the only bride. The bride is going to be restored by Yahweh. A wedding is going to take place with the restored bride. Yahshua is the mediator of the new covenant or new contract. The new covenant is with the house of Judah and the house of Israel, not some unscriptural entity called a church. We are new covenant Israelites of the faith of Abraham. The true congregation of Yahweh is a spiritual organization, not Christians, although we believe in Yahshua the Messiah. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. By Yahweh's love, Gentiles are grafted in to the commonwealth of Israel. For if their casting away is reconciliation of the world, what will be their restoration be except life from the dead? Now if the first fruit is holy, so also is the lump, and if the root is holy, so also the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and became a chair of the root in the fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, it is not you that bears the root, but the root bears you. You will say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. You will say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, for unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be high-minded, but fear, for if Yahweh did not spare the natural branches, fear that it may, he may not spare you either. For if you were cut out of a natural wild olive tree, and against nature were grafted into a good olive tree, how much more these being according to nature will be grafted into their own olive tree? And a mixed multitude went up also with them in flocks and herds and even very much cattle. One ordinance shall be both for you of the congregation and also for the stranger that travels with you. An ordinance forever in your generations as you are so shall the stranger be before Yahweh. One law 
and one manor shall be for you and for the stranger that travels with you. And the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to Yahweh to serve him and to love the name of Yahweh, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and takes hold of my covenant, even them I will bring into my mount and make them joyful on my house of prayer. Their offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called the house of prayer for all people, says Yahweh, who gathers the outcast of Israel, and I will yet gather others besides him to, to his gathered ones. For he is not one who is outwardly a Jew that is a real Jew, nor the circumcision that is seen in the flesh. But he is a Jew that is one inwardly, and the circumcision is of the heart, in the spirit, and not literally, of whom the praise is not from men, but from Yahweh. If you are of Messiah, then you are seeds of Abraham, even heirs according to the promise. The Apostle Peter in Acts 10 28 but Yahweh has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean not however that the word of Yahweh has actually failed but all those who belong to Israel are not Israelites nor because they are Abraham's seed are they all children but in Isaac shall your seed be called, that is, not the children of flesh are children of Yahweh, but the children of promise are accounted for as descendants. And as many as follow this path, peace and mercy be on them and the Israel of Elohim. At the time you were without Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers of the covenants of promise, having no hope and without Yahweh in the world. But now in Messiah Yahshua, you who are afar off and were brought near by the blood of Messiah, so then you are no longer strangers and family members living abroad. You are natives of the same family of saints and children of the family of Yahweh. We will now look at another important part of the Torah, Yahweh's set-apart feast days. These are the feasts of Yahweh, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work in it. It is the Sabbath of Yahweh in all your dwellings. The Apostle Shaul in Colossians 2, 16 and 17 says, Don't let anyone outside the body of Messiah judge us on how we keep the feast day. The spring feasts are Passover. In the fourteenth day of the first month, at evening, is Yahweh's Passover. Yeshua was the lamb that was slain at Passover for our sins. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even the Messiah, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The Apostle Shaul, as you see in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, was not trying to do away from the, with the feast days. Yeshua was sinless, like bread without leaven. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, 
When you are come to the land which I give to you, and shall reap the harvest of it, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh to be accepted for you. On the next day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Yeshua was the first fruits of the resurrection, or the firstborn of the resurrection, presented on the morrow after the Sabbath. But every man in his own order is the Messiah the first fruits, afterwards they that are the Messiahs at his coming. And you shall count to you from the next day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even to the next day after the seventh Sabbath shall you number fifty days, and you shall offer a new meal offering to Yahweh. We received his spirit the same day Israel received the Torah. And Yahweh's spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, enables us to obey him. In the fulfilling of the day of Shavuot, they were all in one mind and in the same place. Shabbat is the Hebrew term for the Greek name Pentecost. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenths deals. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leavening. They are the first fruits to Yahweh. During Yeshua's first advent, he died on Passover, resurrected on first fruits, and the Holy Spirit was given on the Feast of Weeks, or Shabbat. Do you not say, there are yet four months, and then comes harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. The spring and the fall feast are prophetic of the Messiah's greatest works, redemption and restoration. We have already seen his work of redemption. Now let's look at the fall feast. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Yeshua's return will be announced with shofar blasts for the resurrection and coming king. Because the Master himself comes down from heaven with a commanding shout, in an archangel's voice and with the trumpet of Yahweh and the dead in Messiah will raise first then we who remain alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet our master in the air and so we will always be with our master in a moment in the blinking of the eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed but we are waiting for his return and the prophecies of restoration when all Israel will be saved we await the messianic fulfillments of the Feast of Trumpets, Atonements, and Tabernacles. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month, a day of atonement, it shall be a holy convocation to you, and you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh. And you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before Yahweh your Elohim. Yom Kippur, day of atonement, he will pour out his wrath and execute his judgments. Also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast to Yahweh seven days. On the first day, a Sabbath, and on the eighth day, a Sabbath. And you shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before Yahweh your Elohim seven days. It can be proven that Yeshua was born at the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Tabernacles stands for his time when he will pitch his tent with us and rule for a thousand years. It will be a jubilee and all will be restored. Previously, only the remnant kept these things in the land of Israel more than 2,000 years ago. Despite our exile in the nations and the many religious leaders that teach against the Torah, 
we see many people coming back to the biblical feast days. We are overturning strongly entrenched things, exposing long hidden truths, digging for nuggets of gold, so to speak. Some of these things you probably never knew before and are news horizons for you. The scripture says in the last day their religion will not be real. And we're going to look at some of these other practices in Christianity. Shaul told Timothy that they would be fooled by evil spirits and teachings that come from demons. And now we're going to look at the holidays of the world and of Christendom and see how do they line up. The scriptures say that Christendom sank into the depths of pollution as we see in the four scriptures at the bottom. You can look those up. The Apostle Paul said that savage wolves would come in and not spare the flock. Satan has carefully guided many religions back to the false teachings of ancient Babylon. And now we're going to look at some of these customs that are in the world and Christendom. I'm quoting from a book called World Book Childcraft International and it's a book on holidays and birthdays. The day you were born is a very special day for you and your family. You will probably celebrate this holiday with a birthday cake, perhaps a party, and by getting presents. For thousands of years, people all over the world have thought of a birthday as a very special day. Long ago, people believed that on a birthday, a person could be helped by good spirits or hurt by evil spirits. So when a person had birthdays, friends and relatives gathered to protect him or her, and that's how birthday parties begin. The idea of putting candles on birthday cakes goes back to ancient Greece. The Greeks worshipped many gods and goddesses. Among them was a goddess called Artemis. Artemis was a goddess of the moon. The Greeks celebrated her birthday each month by bringing special cakes to her temple. The cakes were round like a full moon and because the moon glows with light the cakes were decor decorated with lighted candles. Are you picking up the same thing I am? The birthday celebrations are conducted with wishes for a good future, trying to protect yourself for the future which seems to be tied to astrology, horoscope, and superstition. Let alone the fact that Childcraft says that these celebrations are linked to the worship of Artemis. Have you ever asked yourself a question? Who told me that I should celebrate my birthday each year? Take a long hard look through the pages of the scripture and you will find that the Pharaoh of Egypt celebrated his birthday on the day in which the chief baker was hung in Genesis 40 verses 22, 20 through 22. And you'll also find that Herod celebrated his birthday on which John the Baptist's head was cut off. That's in Matthew 4, 6 through 10. You won't find that I know of anywhere that Yahweh ever commanded his people to celebrate their birthday. In fact, on the contrary, in Ecclesiastes 7.1 7, 7, it says the day of the death is better than the day of your birth. A horoscope is a chart that shows the influences of the stars supposedly have on a person because of their positions at the time of his birth. Astrologers cast a horoscope by determining which stars were in the ascendant or rising in the east at the time of the person's birth. Halloween is known as the most important festival of the year for witchcraft and satanic cults. All you have to do is look around at Halloween decorations to see what this festival celebrates. Putting the pumpkins and jack-o'-lanterns aside, we see mostly witches, skeletons, and ghosts. Some people even go to the extreme to decorate their yards with tombstones. Spider webs are the most popular decorations, giving the appearance of a haunted house. What does it all just express? Fear, horror, nightmares, emotional distress, fear of being alone, and fear of death. Halloween originally began as a feast of the pagan god Samhain. 
He was known as the Lord of the Dead. Of course, people do not send their small children out trick-or-treating in honor of Sam Hain, the Lord of the Dead, even though that's all they really see by the public eye. Yahweh has said in his words that all form of magic, witchcraft, sorcery, spells, charms, horoscopes, and communication with the dead are abominations. When we promote evil one day a year, even if it were to make fun of fear, we are giving the devil glory. Man fears that which is not real. What he should fear is Yahweh and his wrath, which is real and has been from the beginning of time. If we in this generation, as other generations, are the product of what we read, watch, and listen to as a learned behavior to be okay, what are we teaching today? Halloween is a satanic festival, and the devil, whether you believe in him or not, is getting all the praise. Nothing right comes from this feast. Young people who are former Satanists have testified they begin dabbling into the occult with a very innocent attitude. If only someone had told them as a child that the devil is real and he wants to destroy your life, per perhaps they would have gone to recognize the danger they were entering. Your child's not going to become a Satanist because he went trick-or-treating, but do we really want to communicate to our child that we support what this festival represents? In Halloween, evil is candy-coated for the children. There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or who is an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination to Yahweh, and because of these abominations, Yahweh your Elohim does drive them out from before you. You shall be perfect with Yahweh your Elohim. Understand, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And because you've rejected the word of Yahweh, he has also rejected you from being king. Take heed to yourself that you be not snared by following them, after that they be destroyed from before you, and that you inquire not after their Elohim, saying, How did these nations serve their Elohim? Even so will I do likewise. You shall not so do to Yahweh your Elohim, for every abomination to Yahweh, which he hates, have they done to their Elohim. For even their sons and their daughters they've burnt in the fire to their Elohim. Now we're going to look at the most popular of all the pagan feasts, Christmas. Christmas comes from the word Christ Mass. Mass is actually a celebration of death, and yet they say it's the Messiah's birth. Northern Hemisphere during late December, the days are at their shortest lengths and the nights are at their longest. For those of the pagan world, this has always been the greatest time of the year to celebrate and practice the works of darkness. The pagan calendar identifies this period as the winter solstice. It was during the pre-Christian midwinter pagan celebrations of Scandinavia's Norsemen where today's Christmas traditions began. 
as a means of honoring the pagan sex and fertility god Yule, a 12-day celebration during the month of December was inaugurated. A large single log considered to be a phallic idol was lit on fire and kept burning for 12 days. Animal or human sacrifices were offered in the fire on each of those days. Wild, delirious reveling accompanied the daily sacrifices as drunken participants defiantly strove to make contact with spirits. This is an old picture of mother and child. Semiramis and Sun Tammuz deified in the ancient Babylonian picture. This is a picture of Nimrod, the father, who was a reincarnation of Tammuz. And these are the rays of the sun god. Here is Semiramis, queen of Babylon. The sun above and the queen of heaven, as you see in this picture. The sun, Tammuz, is a triangle in between. Here is Semiramis, the moon god, and Nimrod, the sun god, who gave birth to Tammuz on December the 25th. Here is another depiction of Nimrod, and here is all the names and various cultures for Nimrod, and how they pass from culture to culture. Here's the Roman history of December 25th, originally started by Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. December 21st, the winter solstice, is the shortest day of the year where the daylight period is less than any other time during the year. And at this time, the sun god is said to be reborn. And that's where we eventually got our Christmas. In Rome it was called Saturnalia. Saturnalia was a time of drunken partying and where just about anything goes. Numerous sun gods were born on December 25th from varying cultures all over the world. Most sun gods were fashioned after Nimrod of ancient Babylon. There is an Egyptian hieroglyphic with uh, worshiping the sun god. Christmas is a compromise with paganism. Here is another Egyptian image. Pagans celebrated the birth of the sun on December the 25th. Yeshua the Messiah wasn't born on December the 25th. He was actually born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. In 351 CE, Pope Julius I rules that December 25th was the official day of the Messiah's birth. This was done so the pagans of that day would not have to give up their festivals. The Roman celebration of Saturnalia was held between December the 17th and the 23rd. It was a feast of the dedication of the temple of the god Saturn. A thousand miles away in pre-Christian Rome, celebrants were paying homage to their own gods during the winter solstice. Witchcraft traditions hold that a number of pagan gods were given birth during this period including Dionysus, Attis, and Baal chief male god of fertility and licentiousness. Another pagan god from Persia, identified as Mithra, was said to have been born specifically on December 25th. Mithra was the god of the unconquerable sun, the god of the light between heaven and earth, worshipped at that time by an influential Roman cult. His birth symbolized an end to the long nights and a return to the dominance of the sun. During the month-long winter solstice celebration, courts in Rome were closed. Any and all crimes were allowed. Homosexuality, cross-dressing, and uncontrolled debauchery reigned supreme. 
Rome's order was turned upside down. Even children were allowed to join in the drunken orgies as part of the Juvenalia celebration. By 270 AD, the Roman Emperor Aurelian had made it official, setting aside a seven-day period from December the 17th through the 24th, culminating in an exchange of gifts on December the 25th to celebrate the birth of the sun god. This Roman orgy to end all orgies later became known as Saturnana, in honor of the god Saturn, the god of excess. Roman soldiers invading Britain brought with them their pagan orgiistic traditions. Upon taking root in England, Saturnalia became known as the Festival of Fools reigned over by the Lord of Misrule. By the 4th century, the influential government-sanctioned Church of Rome, unable to outlaw the growing number of pagan practices, chose instead to adopt them into their so-called official Christianity. The church believed this would attract more pagans to their fold. It was hoped that the pagan celebrations of Saturnalia would merge into this new legally sanctioned form of Christianity. The church's practice of changing the dates of Christian events to coincide with pagan festivals continued and by the 7th century Pope Gregory I had ordered Augustine of Canterbury to incorporate any and all pagan practices and customs into the expanding Roman Catholic Church. During the Middle Ages, the debased Mardi Gras atmosphere of what was now known as Christ's Mass had reached a fevered pitch. Common practices included open sex in the streets, rioting, murder, and a number of pagan druidic Halloween rituals. Today's tradition of the Christmas Yule Log stems directly from the worship of the pre-Christian Scandinavian fertility god Yule. The burning of this phallic idol is also responsible for the concept of the 12 days of Christmas, which represented the 12 daily sacrifices offered up in the Yule Log's flames. Another uh, good example of the um, pagan elements of Christmas is the whole concept of Yule and the Yule Log. The, uh, the very term is derived from uh, uh, the Norse god Yule, spelled J-U-L. And uh, uh, every year around Christmas time, uh, a huge log was uh, uh, cut down and uh, fashioned into a uh, fertility symbol and then burned uh, for 12 days and on each successive day a, a, a new sacrifice to the god Yule was performed uh, uh, in the fire and a new sacrificial victim was uh, was burned to death uh, sometimes but not always these sacrificial victims were uh, human beings and the whole uh, notion of the 12 days of Christmas also comes to us from this uh, Norse pagan tradition during the dark ages the European custom of putting an oil lighted wick lamp in the windows during the 12 days of Christmas signified to neighbors that the occupants were participating in the pagan worship of the phallic idol Yule. In today's commercialism, this is where we get the tradition of decorating our houses with Christmas lights. The Yule log custom was originally brought over to America by Scandinavian immigrants during the 1600s. And despite attempts to ban the tradition, it has stayed with us to this very day. Today, when we wish someone Yuletide greetings, we are in a sense invoking the power of the fertility god Yule upon that person. During the Saturnalia celebrations, holly and other greens were hung over doorways as part of a pagan ritual to ward off evil. To deck the halls with boughs of holly was to acknowledge the powers of the nature gods. According to Wiccan rituals, placing holly or other greens in the shape of a circle or wreath accentuated its magical power. Similarly, mistletoe, when used in the casting of Wiccan or Druidic spells, could render a woman helpless and open to sexual exploitation. This is where we get our custom of hanging mistletoe in doorways today, and if a woman is caught underneath, she may be kissed and must not resist.
the fir tree, uh, the mistletoe, uh, all of these things uh, typically uh, are come from uh, uh, overtly uh, pagan traditions, uh, in, typically in, from Northern Europe, German, Norse, and uh, English. Likewise, evergreen trees have always represented sex and fertility in pagan cultures. During the winter solstice, trees would be chopped down, brought inside, set up, and decorated as idols for worship. The Christmas tree was regarded uh, as, a, as a sacred tree. Uh, the, uh, the pagans of Northern Europe uh, t typically uh, worshipped trees. They uh, regarded trees uh, and groves as sacred. So uh, uh, the bringing of the uh, tree into the house would be a way of uh, bringing this uh, supernatural uh, source of blessing. Uh, into your home. That was that was the whole idea that there were there were spirits uh, who resided in the trees. In the Middle Ages, the tradition of the winter solstice Christmas tree primarily took root in Germany. During his reign, King George the First, himself of German extraction, brought the custom to Victorian England. German immigrants settling in Pennsylvania did the same in America during the early 1800s. In 1848. The London Illustrated News published this famous engraving depicting Queen Victoria and her royal family beside a decorated Christmas tree. And within a few years, nearly every English household had their own tree in allegiance to the monarchy. By 1900, the U.S. Forest Service estimated that at least one in five homes in America had adopted the Christmas tree tradition. decorated the evergreen trees in a way of, to honor the indwelling tree spirits. Like his pagan ancestors, he brings the tree indoors and decorates it. From Jeremiah 10, 2, so says Yahweh, do not learn the way of the nations, and do not be terrified at the signs of heavens, for the nations are terrified at them. For the customs of the people are vanity, for one cuts a tree out of the forest with the axe, the works of the hands of the craftsmen, and they adorn it with silver and gold, and they fasten it with nails and hammers, so it will not wobble. Decorating the Christmas tree is an imitation of ancient... Santa Claus is another uh, good example of a pagan element of, of Christmas. Santa Claus, as we know him today, is a uh, an amalgamation of several different traditions. But uh, in most cultures throughout the world, uh, you will find the existence of what is known as hearth gods, uh, gods who uh, guard uh, the hearth and the chimney and keep the fires burning and make sure the food cooks properly and the people are warm and what have you. And at a certain time of year, 
uh, in the middle of winter, typically, uh, the hearth god dressed in red will come down the chimney to reward those who uh, have pleased him during the course of the previous year and to uh, lay uh, curses or hexes or other forms of uh, uh, punishment upon uh, people who have displeased him. The concept of Santa Claus has had a long and winding history with a number of diverse cultures contributing to the composite character we have today. Beginning once again in Scandinavia, Santa's original incarnation was in the form of Odin, the pagan god of thunder a tall fellow with a long flowing beard who inhabited the spirit-infested Nordic forests. Odin would travel the sky during the winter solstice deciding who would die and who would prosper. Most believers were frightened of this particular time of year. In England, Odin eventually evolved into Father Christmas, who, crowned with sprigs of holly, traveled the countryside getting roaring drunk as part of the Festival of Fools celebration. Frequently, he would be accompanied by a horned goat. According to the traditions of the Church of Rome, there was a Turkish bishop named Nicholas who hailed from Myra in Asia Minor during the 4th century. He was known as the patron saint of seafaring men. Over the centuries, as the legend began to unfold, it was rumored that St. Nicholas had actually captured the devil himself put him in chains and made him his personal servant. Mario, the devil is actually given the title Venoxman or Santa Claus. 19th century writer Theodore Storm in his story about Necht Ruprecht even goes so far as to describe the switches given to the children by Ruprecht as tools to be used in sadomasochistic rituals. Soon the image of Ruprecht would fade from the Christmas tradition but not his sadistic influence. Many of the early depictions of Santa Claus portrayed him not as a jolly gift giver, but of an unfriendly disciplinarian complete with a ready switch or whip. By 1880, Santa was a thoroughly secularized folk hero who had become increasingly irresistible to retailers worldwide. One factor that has contributed to uh, the paganization of Christmas, the complete paganization of Christmas, has been the element of commercialism. Uh, it may seem odd to think of it in that context, but uh, remember that Christ himself identified the love of money as a spiritual force in and of itself. And where it comes into play, it has a kind of naturally hostile effect on, uh, on the gospel and the, uh, uh, the Christian faith. So the commercialization of Christmas has helped to h highlight the pagan elements. He takes the place of God or of Jesus Christ in the special world that is Christmas. Uh, he has supernatural knowledge of, uh, of your history. He has supernatural knowledge of, uh, of your present, of your attitudes. He's keeping a list. He knows who's naughty and nice. Your parents don't even know that. Uh, he's obviously got some uh, some conduit to knowledge that is uh, beyond the human. Uh, and he, uh, he flies through the air. Uh, he was capable of visiting every place on the globe in the course of a single night. In many, many ways, Santa exhibits supernatural qualities that uh, provide a kind of a surrogate deity or a substitute for, uh, for God or for Christ. Take the N in the middle of Santa and move it to the end, and it spells Satan. Christmas is just another false teaching from pagan Christianity. And now the pagan origins of Easter. From the Encyclopedia Britannica, Easter derived from Oyster an Anglo-Saxon goddess of spring and fertility. From Wikipedia, Easter, the modern English term Easter developed from the Old English term 
Easter or Oster? And here is a picture of the Oster. Spring fertility goddess. Astarte, Greek, Beltus, and Nineveh, Astoroth in Hebrew, and Ishtar, Babylonian, which means cruel and wayward. Here is a picture of Ishtar of Babylon. And the children gather wood, and the father kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven, and pour out drink offerings unto other Elohim. But what will, we will certainly do, whatever thing goes out of our mouth, to burn incense to the queen of heaven. And we burned incense to the queen of heaven, and poured out drink offerings to her, and did we also, without her men, make her cakes and worship her images? Here is the same goddess Isis, the Egyptian goddess. Same deity, only a different culture. In Alexander Hislop's book, Two Babylons, Samarimus was co-founder with Babylon with Nimrod. Eusebius says it reigned during the time of Abraham and founded the mystery religion. The book was written in 1853, Two Babylons. And here's Nimrod. Samarimus' husband and son. And here's uh, Nimrod, uh, ancient Inova uh, artifact. Notice holding the reindeer and the tree. Samarimus and Istar. Tammuz, the immaculately conceived god child who became the husband of his mother. That's the mother and child symbolism you see worldwide. And here are some of the other uh, mother and child deities from all over the world. Babylon, Egypt, India, and then of course uh, the nativity scene which came from the same mother and child worship. Here's some of the names from different places of the mother and son and father from Lebanon, Babylon, Assyria, Greece, Rome, Egypt, India, and so on. You can stop that anytime and read that. And he brought me to the opening of the gate of the house of Yahweh toward the north, and behold, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Who is Tammuz? In mythology, Tammuz loved rabbits as a child, lived to be 40 years old, also known as Bacchus. Samarimus, Ishtar, and Astarte went to the underworld to plead for her husband's son so they could both be resurrected to the light. Ancient people mourned 40 days prior to spring, so Tammuz would be resurrected again with him in the spring. This 40 days turned into Christian Lent. When Samarimus died, she returned to earth in an enormous egg which hit the river Euphrates in early spring. Pagan religions adopted the egg symbol. 
The initial colored egg was one covered with blood of a nine-month-old sacrificed infant. The eggs are symbols of fertility. Hot cross buns, first mentioned in Jeremiah 7, the cross or the sign of the cross actually stems from the mystic towel, the letter T of the first letter for Tammuz. Here is a list of ancient practices that began in Babylon and have now infiltrated modern day Christianity. What about the term Amen? Amen comes from the Egyptian god Amun-Ra. So we should not use that at the end of our prayers. And Christendom is known for calling others cults. Are you afraid to tell your family and friends about the truth of Yahweh? Are you afraid of being treated as an outcast by all? Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I am not come to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me and he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me and he that takes not his stake and follows after me is not worthy of me being set apart or different from the world is an honorable thing the apostle john said that do not love the world nor the things in the world if anyone loves the world love of the Father is not in him.
Yeshua the Messiah invites us to the marriage supper of the Lamb. His father Yahweh is ridiculed, hated, falsely accused, and his existence is denied. Most people don't want to hear all the truth. They plug their ears, they run away from you, and they don't want to accept the truth. But be like the five wise virgins who had oil in their lamps. But stand firm in your faith, putting on the whole armor of Yahweh. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them.